evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this is William Kentridge's studio, and um, it's always such a pleasure to be in here where the sort of magic happens. Um, we had to move, in fact, uh, into the space because the centre couldn't house the number of enthusiastic people wanting to, of course, be part of this conversation. So. Um, yeah, tonight is uh, part of the For Once program at the Center for the Less Good Idea, which is a recently launched incubator space for the arts um, across the disciplines and founded by William. And um, the For Once program is really kind of inspired by that clumsy South Africanism where you go, oh, For Once, it's in Joburg. And um, yeah, for <laughs> It's incredible to have these two here um, and sharing an ongoing conversation that they've had with one another for some time now. I believe um, Homi invited William to do um, a lecture as part of the Norton Lecture Series at Harvard. Not a lecture. Right. The whole Internal. Thank you. <laughs> so um, uh, we're at Harvard where uh, uh, Homi K. Baba is a professor of English and American literature and language. And of course, as we know, one of the most important contemporary thinkers and writers on the post-colonial condition and studies. Um, so I'm not going to delay it any further. Thank you two very much. Um, I just wanted to say two things. One, at the end, the floor will be open for questions and there'll be some roaming mics. And secondly, at 8 p.m. at the center, which is just down the passage um, at our headquarters, we're having our first run of Waza Albert um, with a brilliant Hamilton Dlamini and Becky McQuane. And um, it really is a treat um, if, if you saw it in the 80s or when it's come back again, these two are on fire. So stick around, have a dinner and join us that side. There are a few tickets still remaining. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, firstly, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the, both to the studio, to the Center for the Less Good Idea, and to John. Johannesburg. Yes. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. It's fantastic that you're here for all of us. And we'll find a balance between you talking about things and me talking about things and how it flows. But we thought that we'd start as a kind of uh, a reference point for some of the conversation we'll have afterwards with a five-minute extract from a, a film, which is I'll show on the screen. It's part of More Sweetly Play the Dance, which in fact is an eight-screen projection piece of a long processional piece. But this will give some idea of the flavor and the nature of it, and we'll take the conversation from there. All right, so let's do that. William, just one thing might be worth pointing out, the way in which there is a break between the screens uh, when yeah. you actually see it. So, that so there are eight screens that make up the projection, but it's not a seamless stitching. It is possible with modern technology to join these different screens together. But in fact, what became clear when we did the film was that the disjunctions as someone exited but didn't immediately exit the next screen. There was a, an interruption in the time and in the rhythm. And this is one of the eight screens and it's a section of the film. The whole piece lasts about 14 minutes and we'll show five minutes.
Okay. Well, before we begin, I just want to thank Anne and William for bringing us, Jackie and me, into their lives. I want to thank their children for opening up this whole world. And I want to thank everybody in the studio, uh, not only for the great gifts that they provide us, but for a lesson in really collaborative, equitable thinking and working. And I want to thank everybody in the studio. And I would appreciate it if we could give a hand to every person in the studio. And to everybody here in this wonderful yes. space. Too. Thank you. So, William, I'm having a slight problem, as you can see. I hope you've picked up the anxiety because I can't find the less good idea. Okay. I can only find good ones. Shall I start with one of them? You can start, and then I'll show you why. Yeah, it's you show me why idea. it's not good enough. <clears throat> no, no, the less good is good enough. Oh. It's the good idea that's that is less good. Yes. Okay. So then I'll start with good ones so that yeah. then it can become less good as we go on. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, great. So I wanted to ask you, you know, about the signature of your work. I think that many artists present initially in a certain kind of way. Like with Picasso, there is a kind of give or take, a frontal presentation of groups of people, of issues, of jugs, of vases. Or with Caravaggio, there's a kind of oblique entrance, a diagonal in the way in which you get into the work, through the backs of figures and you look around them. But with your work, it seems to me movement. Movement is absolutely central. Nothing is static. No object is just placed before us. No sky is complete without the flicker of another movement, another cloud. Objects continually appear and disappear. And I just wondered what you, th how that sense of movement, continual movement. Well, I think that, I think temperamentally, people either see the world as a series of facts, of givens, or they see it as a, pro as, as a continuing process in the state of provisionality. So that if you draw a table, you've drawn a table and you present a table, there's the table. But if it's a drawing that you're going to rub out and adjust and change, then you're saying a table, in fact, is a very unstable object. It's one moment between the tree and the plank and the table and the fire and the smoke and the ashes, and that's, that's the actual story of a table. So there's a sense, but temperamentally, I think that's about an anxiety about commitment about saying this is it and nothing else. It can always be something slightly different. It can always be rescued. So I think that, that's one of the reasons. Um, but there is a sense, if you've ever worked with film, as soon as one started working with film, the pleasure of seeing the world as um, Goddard said, as 24 mm, frames mm -hmm. a second, as that's what the world exists in. And so I think you're right. I mean, there are artists, you think of the Picasso, the frugal repast, the man and the woman and the bottle on the table and that's where they sit. But you think back before that and you think of Goya where everything is in movement. There are crowds coming over hills, there are always people half behind the horizon. So I think that this must probably right that a lot of the work has to do with movement either literally in the yeah, form yeah. of animation or even if it's a static drawing with a gesture of movement. And now as you speak I think the same of Bruegel. Yes. the continual movement of objects, things, ideas, and meanings. And so the processional form, which has been such an important motif for you and an important method of working for you, is really a, a matter of movement. But in the uh, uh, work we just saw, which is a kind of dance of death, yeah. um, it seems to me that you have Faced with, you're faced with a very complex challenge because this is not only the movement of bodies, of things, of provisionality, it's also the movement of time, of life and death, of the spectral on the one hand and the survival on the other because right through these processions which you've called the processions of the dispossessed, there is this sense of the margin between living and dying as indeed even in the traditional dance of death, being continually presented. Well, I mean, just in that, when we did this film, which, as you say, started off with an idea of doing a dance macabre, a dance of death, the medieval form in which 
you saw death first with the king and then the bishop and then the preacher and then with the farmer and then with the peasant and then with the child. In other words, saying death would take everyone and it's usually a, a, long, it's a long freeze is the image. So you do get, and there is the figure of Dada Masilo, is the figure that goes through the series of, uh, of, of people. But you also have the other um, tradition which is the dancing against death, the idea that if you could keep dancing in the village squares, you could keep the plague away. And that if you could keep you, telling the story you could, that every day, then, then death would be kept would at be bay. Would be kept at bay. So, it was, so both of those elements, I think, are in the... Both of those elements are in the film, but while doing it, that wasn't really the central question. The question when you're making it is always a much more stupid question. The less good question. It's a less good question. In other words, it's what actually emerges when people... I can show you... I mean, this is... The clip I've got here is of some of the preparatory work. We did. Trying to work out what is the sort of step, what is the kind of walking that people have to do that is going to work in the final film. So we set in the studio here. We had a, a long ramp similar to what we're sitting on. And then I would have the actors trying many different kinds of of movement on the basis that I couldn't in advance say this was going to be the right kind but when we saw it in the edited form it would reveal itself as feeling appropriate um, or not. So here's another short clip of this is in fact was for the Wozzeck Opera project. But that's the but same it, sort of problem. It's the same sort of question. It was again filmed as this <coughs> procession, trying to find what was the logic of movement. So this, this very much had to do with shell shock in the First World War and different kinds of uh, damage and moving in it. So there are, I mean, the, the walk is vital, but finding out quite who it is that's doing the walk is, is less clear. That I hope gets shown by the film when it's finished, rather than knowing it in advance. So the idea of you saying it between life and death, that strikes me as feeling right, but it's not how I'd begun it. And I think it's always interesting, the starting point is very often not the meaning that you anticipate. No, that's right. But watching it now, and even hearing you here, where you say there's one movement towards death and one to resist death, so that in those steps you are working out that tension and what feels appropriate to you in that tension. I can completely understand that you start with the step and then the concept in a way follows, the burden of the work follows. But there are two things that I think are part of the detail of making that you talk about, the construction of the step, as well as the larger idea. Mm. And the, that's the fact that in the, in the music and in the movement, there is this notion of death cometh not, death will come, you know? And you, you often use music to explain tension. And or, or, or the coupling of what you often call the whilst, where two things are happening at the same time. You've talked about the whilst, you've made works where the notion of the whilst, which is of course now an archaic form, because now we say while. There is no actual grammatical need to say whilst, but it gives it a presence. You know, so when you've talked about the whilst, the, the notion of the whilst where you say something is happening, something quotidian, and then suddenly there is that Knock on the door. I mean, it is, whilst is a very interesting, strange uh, category. And I suppose this, the, the processions are something that's going on, that's going on. We're not certain where its end point is. It doesn't necessarily have a, a clear end point. Um, and it's, in a way, waiting for the interruption. Yeah. But the whilst itself is an interesting term, because it is archaic. But it is the standard term that mm. used to be used. I'm not sure if it's still used, but it's the standard term that was used in all mine accident reports. There was a standard form. You know, when you go to the police station, you have to make a report. There's a standard kind of grammar that policemen use when they're writing about your car was parked and you came back and the window was smashed and your cell phone's gone. And this was for reporting mining accidents. And the form of reporting a mining accident by all the different junior clerks or shift bosses or whoever was filling in the, the register recording these accidents, you would start every sentence with whilst. 
whilst I was pushing the cocoa, whilst so-and-so was pushing the cocoa pan along the railway track, the rock fell and hit him. Whilst he was walking home towards the compound, uh, he was attacked by three people and his pay packet stolen. Whilst, and so whilst is always the, and so as you say, it's two times. It's the idea of something that continues, that's an ordinary activity, a, a usual activity, and then the, the very fact of the whilst alerts you to the fact that there's going to be some emergency. Yeah, and this is, for me, looking at the work, the way in which the, the foot works in your work, the, both the footwork of the work, but also in the concept of the foot, what you have called foot power, you know, foot labor, the, the notion of the fact that most people these days carry their burden, psychic or otherwise, while walking. You know, walking is so important for you. Now, walking is important for you as a, as, as a mode of thinking as a practice. You've often said that. You often show work where you're walking in the studio. This kind of ambulant thought. Yes. Uh, but walking also marks a certain time in the works themselves, obviously in these processional works. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about foot power, about this notion of walking, about thinking while walking, bearing in mind what you haven't seen, which is that in this work itself that you just saw, there is a figure that moves counter to the procession, that comes across it, against the grain of the procession. And I think that these different strategies of dealing with inevitability or fatality while actually living and surviving uh, is something I'd like us to talk about, just you know, the, the very physical nature of how you make that walking. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the larger implications, because you have a vocabulary about the an anonymity of load bearers and the notion of movement. But it would be good to talk about this notion of the foot. Well, the... I mean, maybe just to, to show, if one's talking about walking, I'll just show it along here. Um, one thinks of walking as a completely, there's nothing really much to say about it. But, I mean, the, well, as soon as you start saying, well, let's do a program or let's do some filming about walking, you think, well, are you someone who's walking, is, as it were, led by your chest? Someone who, the central point of movement is your chest? Or are you someone who is, the central point of movement, in fact, is your head? So when you're walking, it's, in fact, your head that is determining the walk. Or are you led by your nose? Are you someone who walks and you... Or are you someone who's led by the knees when you walk? Or in fact, your knees the way that determine how you move through the world. So there's a whole kind of grammar in minutiae, mm. which one works with the performers doing that, that are in a way separate from the meaning of it. What does it mean mm. if you're led by the... But having done that, once you see it, there are certain ways, if your foot is, the, if, the, if there's a sense of the weight of a foot that you have to carry with you, they kind of, you start building in an, an, an exhaustion. So it's a mixture of that, and then also say, studying films of people with shell shock, and the particular way in which shuffle, they, yeah. a shuffle, a particular kind of shuffle, which we might show to actors and then see what can be done, and see how that works. So it's, it's not a random walk, but it's not a, completely known walk. For example, in this area around where we are, in Maboneng, there's a big recycling depot, and every day of the week, people sort through people's domestic rubbish and load it onto trolleys and pull these trolleys from all the corners of Johannesburg to close to here. And it's, there's a way of moving, of people who spend their lives in physical labor, moving and walking and pulling these trolleys and riding them down the hills. That's, that's very difficult to try to find. In the end, we found we had to actually load real trolleys with enormous weight and really have a real resistance for people to pull against to try to, to get it. But it is something in this, I mean, and this is just emblematic, that one understands in an era when there are huge refuge trucks, when there are massive you know, internal combustion engines, so many people still rely, A, so many people rely on their own human physical power to get their work done, to, to earn their bread. Pulling these trolleys is one of the ones. But even more than that, there's the way in which the huge recycling depot companies rely on this informal labor as part of their model of how they're actually going to run their company and factory. So that sense of that mixture of 
very simple and direct labor of walking, and walking is kind of emblematic of that, in the modern world, not as an aberration, but as a something that's built into it. Yeah, I mean, you, that's why embodiment is so important, I think, in your work. Even in your sketches, the flesh, the flesh being pulled down, the, the, the heave of the, of the shoulders. I think embodiment is extraordinarily important. And from what you've said now, at a time when people keep talking now about new technologies and the post-human and so on, I think what you, the, the interesting corrective in your work is to show how a whole set of external practices of labor, practices of grief, practices of war, shell shock, etc., actually change the body. You know, change the body as indeed they change the mind. And I want to read something to you uh, which made quite an impression on me when I wrote about this piece yeah. for Art Forum and for the London show. Uh, you say, who are these anonymous carriers in the procession? Who are they? Taken for granted by Plato, you refer to the allegory, taken for granted by us as we see them walking through the streets of Johannesburg, through the streets of so many cities of the world. They're the peasants, the proletariat, the unemployed, people at the margins of society. As Wojtek says, if ever we get to heaven, we'd still have to help make the thunder ourselves. So <clears throat> there is this concept in the walking, you know? Mm -hmm. You gave us many specific walks, but one thing you're interested in is the, an, is the effectivity or the agency of the anonymous. You know, all our history, all our politics teaches us to specify. This form of labor is different from that form of labor. This mode of, uh, this is a vestigial mode of labor. That is a more, uh, that's a different kind of industrial capital mode of the, of, of, of the construction of the body of work. Now what, there is this notion in you that there is something ma that makes, that erases, that makes anonymous. A, the, a group of people, the procession in this case, the procession of the dispossessed, and we have to be as attentive to that anonymity as possible. And in this, if I might, sorry. No, yeah. no, 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 keep going. I just wanted to throw something yeah. in here and to connect that with the notion of movement that we've been talking yeah. about, anonymity and movement. And <clears throat> I just wanted to throw at you an idea uh, of Hannah Arendt's, which I think has a great to do, deal to do with processions. It has a great deal to do with the marginalized, disadvantaged, the stateless, and indeed now even migration, and is profoundly uh, embedded in the notion of movement. Where she says, of all the specific liberties which may come into our minds when we hear the word freedom, freedom of movement is historically the oldest and also the most elementary. Being able to depart from where we will is the prototypical gesture of being free as limitation of freedom of movement has from time immemorial been the precondition for enslavement. Freedom of movement is also the indispensable condition for action and is in action that men and women primarily experience freedom freedom in the world. Now, at the moment, the freedom of movement is a hugely important issue in, around migration, around labor, around, this, uh, around safety, security, economic uh, uh, well-being, and so on. But it does seem to me that your emphasis in these possessions is about how to appreciate and how to recognize this anonymity and respect in the actual footfalls itself the notion of movement, and you talk about foot power. Yeah, I'm trying to. I mean, the, I'm trying to get to, to make sense of the anonymity question. Um, they're not specific people, as you say. It's not saying oh, we have to show this kind of character and that kind of character. There's a broad costume pile that we draw from and props that we have and that we work with. But I would say that the inflection is very local. In other words, it's working very much with Johannesburg performers and musicians and things that they bring to the work that we're doing here. The way of spinning around that you see in different ch uh, church services where people pray as they're hitting a Bible and spinning on the spot, which is different from a whirling dervish. It's a very, sp feels a very specifically local kind of movement in it. There's a kind of the way that you move your arm, if you've got a broomstick in it, that's reminiscent of uh, Zulu stick fighting, 
that's different from the way someone would use a stick if I'm working with an actor in a different part of the world. So I think it's, it's not trying to say, here we're going to show you what Johannesburg mm -hmm. feels like, but it's very much I'm aware of how much it is shaped by those things which are built into bodies, habits of movement, kinds of rhythms, the two women who are shaking their sticks as they walk through in the, in the procession. That was simply saying to people, I want you to cross the stage and you've got a stick and make your way across the space. And people had many different ways of doing it. Um, and I suppose that would be the less good idea. I couldn't tell them how I want you to move, but it was in recognizing the anonymous specificities that it became, that were the moments we would hang on to in the, in the workshop. We'd say, all right, that was great. Let's repeat that. Let's hang on to that, remember that when we come back to what we're doing. I mean, the, the great pleasure of talking with you is that you always make the process of making part of the discussion of the less good idea or the better idea or the worse idea. No, but that's because, I mean, when the work is finished, then I become simply a somewhat privileged but not particularly acute describer or analyst of the work. I mean, then I'm watching it from the outside. Yeah. And then sometimes I can describe it well, and sometimes what you're saying about it is much more interesting than what I would say about it. And that's as it should be. Because the process of is, you know, when you're working on the inside, you arrive at something which is not necessarily the result of a clarity at the beginning. No. Um, so can I ask you then, having now talked about the use of different forms of action and acting and the specificity of it, uh, is anonymity in the procession also about people who in some way or another are chained? Is there a chain gang thing, that there is a restriction of these lives? Yeah. Uh, you know, however much they grapple against fate or and make a life of them and take the burden of music and actually move with it, so exercise to some extent the right to movement, they are chained in a particular way. Well, there, I mean, there was in the 19th century, at the start of, and it's a 19th century phenomenon in Russia, has to do with industrialization, that they would have these canals and they would move goods along the canals with boats. And the way that these huge barges would be moved would be with these burlaks, as they were called, which were the barge pullers, where there would be teams of 20 or 50 people roped together, not with chains, but with ropes and cloths, pulling these barges. Because all that material, iron, ore and things, was needed for the factories that were being built. So it's not a remnant of a pre-wheel or pre-industrial, it's part of the industrial system, but people were cheaper than horses. So they could have got horses to do it, and horses you have to feed all year, so they'll come back next year. People you can use for the season when you have to move it, and when it freezes over, they have to look after themselves and come back the next year. And that's kind of what we still have with our garbage collectors and sorters here. So that, that sense of being chained together, yes, is part of it. Um, is very much, and of course, there are, what one has as soon as one does any image is that there are sets of associations that come. So as soon as you have the idea of people stumbling along with objects holding them, you've got those images of chains of slaves being led across the continent shackled together. If you're in America, your association would be more to prison chain gangs yeah, of people done together, but that's not our first association uh, here. It could only be through movies that we would think of that. So those sets of association, that's why we had teams of people pulling mm. those, pulling those um, trolleys. Um, I'm still I'm trying to think, how, they are anonymous, the people. It's not trying to, but it is also about a compendium of people about the large, about the fact that it's a horizontal procession that starts at, enters one side of the frame and exits the other, means even though you've only seen eight people across there, there's a sense that maybe there are another 8,000 waiting to come in from the wings and continue across. Um, but what about that figure which our audience, some of them have seen, others haven't, that moves across in the other way? In the that other, when I wrote about yes. the piece, that really intrigued me. Breaking. It did. It's the starting point. Also, if you come in at the beginning, it's the first figure. If you come in in the middle, it's later on. And it's the person who spins at great speed against the direction of the, of the crowd. And the way it arose is we were filming people, and we sometimes would film one person at a time walking across, and we'd film them 
many times because we had eight screens to film. And uh, Tali Macheni, one of the great percussionists who was acting for us, he, did, he went across, I said, all right, let's just go back and do it again. And his way of going back to the starting point was to spin and go across. And immediately said, no, no, that's what we actually want. Let's spin and go back. So something that starts outside of Simti's way of returning to the beginning became a very particular and intriguing, even if we couldn't say quite what it meant. But there was a, a joy and a speed and a lightness and an energy in it which felt important as a counterpoint to a slow pace that other people would be. And it is, it's a kind of moment of running away from the death or running away from whatever people are going to. That was, so it wasn't that I knew it, but we recognized something when we right, when it happened. Right, and when I wrote about it, that was one of the first things that I, the deprecession of yes. the procession is the first thing. But you know, in this conversation, as, it, as, as it's been unfolding, um, <clears throat> you know, I've been trying to, Put, put, a, put a kind of a, a narrative around it and you've been taking that apart and showing how actually that narrative got constituted. So we've been speaking at two kinds of scales. Right. But scale is extraordinarily important in your work and it's effective. You talk about the foot as you have done, mm -hmm. the step, the importance of the step, the carrying of the body and then you also create these great panoramic works. You know, I'm thinking about the Rome piece, which we walked alongside the Tiber forever, mm -hmm. uh, looking, seeing it unfold, the scroll pieces. How, I've often wondered, given the, how scale enters the studio around an idea, because scale is really not about bigness and smallness, it's about complexity about the articulation of the pieces. And for instance, when I see the sculptures of the horses you make, the ones where the, you know, the, the bone structure is missing, they may be this size, but they have a huge scale. You know that they could be scaled up. There are other, Indian miniatures are like that. Mm. The whole use of space within the miniature is, the miniature may be, I don't know, whatever, 14 yeah. inches, and yet you feel there's a whole major wow. scalar issue. So I'm just interested to take anything you want from the, this, and to tell us how scale develops, how you decide to do it at one scale rather than another, or juxtapose scale. Well, the, I mean, the, the easiest way of thinking about scale is the, when one, as soon as one starts to work with projection or shadows, you're working with something that changes. Shadows work in a kind of inverted way. As you move further away from the wall but closer to the source of the light, your shadow gets larger and larger. So that one can say, right, let's look at this shadow life size, if it's right, if you're right at the wall, or if you go right up to the source of the light, your shadow fills the whole space. And one can play with against that with one small shadow and one larger shadow. And in a way, if you're working with a film projection like this, one could have projected that the size of this wall or it. And if you're working with a tapestry also, there's a literal sense in which you make a, make a drawing of a certain scale and then it gets enlarged into the, into the tapestry. So that flexibility of physical size um, is a kind of good loosening exercise to think about scale. But the other when one works on, a, on an opera model, for example, mm. you're working on something this size, but you know it's going to be enlarged to the size of this wall. And so one works with a kind of detail or allowing extra things to fit in, because you know it will be expanded and you'll see it as it, um, as it grows. But I think what, they, what they're both about is the, the sense in the studio of a space where both physically, practically, and metaphorically you can contract the world, you can slow time down, you can speed it up, you turn it into a physical material you can work with in your hands, whether it's a piece of music or pieces of erasure, so that time becomes something you can work with, a scale of time. You can, as you say, you can work with a tiny maquette knowing it's going to be enormous. So it becomes a, the studio becomes a space for those kinds of stretching and contractions. Um, which then do have all sorts of, as you say, echoes and associations outside of the studio when the work leaves the studio. So when do you know if a scale is wrong? How do you know you, you're experimenting with something, you're working it out and you say, this object or this idea is now at the wrong scale? 
quite often it happens with enlargements. Enlargements. That you find that things which uh, work. So it, it's paradoxical because you can look at a model and you can then imagine that enlarged. So you can see that as a huge, a huge room. And then you can build this huge scale, this huge model. You can build it full size. And then you look at that and you say, gosh, I could really imagine that as a beautiful tiny model that you could shrink it back down. And I think that it, it sort of expands and contracts both ways. And you're looking, you imagine. The imagination always has the possibility of a dissatisfaction with the original source of, the, of what you're looking at. Do you, do, is your interest in animation, because in animation you can continually play with scale? And you do often uh, Yes, play. I do play. I mean, the playing, with, the playing with scale is usually at the end of the process when you're projecting it. When you're drawing it, there's a kind of scale that feels natural to the mark, which is to say, if you're working on a tiny sheet of paper, then your finest mark is going to be very crude. If you're working with charcoal, when you project it, your finest mark will be enormous. So if you want something relatively fine, you know your drawing has to be of a, a larger scale. That's in relation to the mark your fingers mm -hmm. or your hand will make. If you're working with white chalk on black paper to do a negative drawing, then it has to be even larger because chalk is a very, uh, in a, a very fat mark if you want fine lines. So the scale is partly determined by the materials that you are um, working with. If you're working with wax, there's a sense of being able to hold the wax in your hand. If you're doing a giant piece, wax would become impractical. So it's, it's very often a series of practical considerations that shape the, not just the, what you make, but also what it means, what the yeah. meaning is at the end. So this work here, this work is a test of cardboard, scale. Cardboard, right? Cardboard, but it's a, the, the wax sculpture, in fact, is about this big, uh -huh. much smaller than a real jug, and this is obviously bigger than a real jug. And it's, it's under consideration, the cardboard. <laughs> under think, advisement. Under advisement, to think what would it, I mean, I kind of like it in cardboard, and then I think, well, should it turn into wood? Should we work with laminate? Is it going to be filled with cement? Is it, I don't know. Uh, it was just, it's here now because it was too big to get out the door. No, and I think, talk, for the talk and today. given that we were talking of scale, I yes. thought we should no, actually no, no, look at it. The little shelves at the back, that usually holds the sculptures of which this is one. There's a series of 40 small, 40 small objects which are like right. little words in the text. <clears throat> William, you've often, you work in many different genres yes. and modes. Um, you know, animation, sculpture, Opera, tapestry. What is the what is the kind of translational desire? I don't know how else to put it. Uh, um, to 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 move in that way. Uh, the work, of course, has its themes. It has its intellectual history. It has its visual history. Its conceptual history. But you you work like this, and then the other. Um, artists whose work I find uh, very interesting, who also works like this, is Matthew Barney. So that, you know, a particular moment from a film of his then becomes the basis of a certain sculptural uh, 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 herb mm -hmm. or repertoire. And it's not reflective. It's not as if it's exegetical. I'm taking this from this work in order to make other examples. It's a, it's a kind of complementary, often conflictual conversation. And I find that idea of translation and conversation across your work it's expressed in the use of different or media, in a kind of intermediatic way. I mean, I think it, one has to think of it as a kind of translation and of what you gain from an imperfect translation, rather than saying if you translate from one language to another, there's always only a loss. Very often the impossibility of a perfect translation is a gain. There are all sorts of other things that are opened up by it. So turning a drawing into a woodcut, there are different ways of working with charcoal and cutting with a gouger into a block of wood. And it, even if you keep the outline the same, all right, here's the same woman, we'll, it's a drawing, an ink drawing, a charcoal drawing, and now we do it as a woodcut. There's something in the accumulation of the gouge marks that you would use to clear the wood in areas which you want not black that changes the, 
the feeling. It kind of embeds into the image those hours of labor time of the physical, of the physical cutting. You're aware that it's a made, a made object. Um, it sets the possibilities for other kinds of drawings, having seen what that drawing looks like translated into, into wood. And so I think the translation from form to form, a rhinoceros as a drawing, as an etching, as a sculpture, um, is not about achieving the perfect rhinoceros. Mm, yeah. Obviously there's the idea of a rhinoceros somewhere in the background, or the question of a rhinoceros rather than the fact of a rhinoceros. I mean, it's, I've never ever drawn a hippopotamus. And I think, well, why, if I draw a rhinoceros, why leave out the poor hippopotamus? And I, I made it, at one point I said, okay, I'm only going to draw things I've never drawn before. So I won't draw a rhinoceros, I'll draw another hippopotamus, I'll draw a hippopotamus. Or I won't draw a hyena, I'll draw an ant bear. Although I have drawn an ant bear, so it wouldn't be an ant bear. Um, and then I find that, no, in fact, I'm more interested in the 400th rhinoceros than in the first hippopotamus. And it's not, I mean, it's, it would be nice to say, oh, I really have mastered how to draw a rhinoceros, but I haven't. Because you don't want to I master. Don't, it's not the, if I could, maybe I would want to, but I know that I can't. And so, no, there no, are, no in, terms of doing, in terms of doing good drawing, there are many, many people who would draw rhinoceros much, much better. I have no, I mean, I know that. I know that. I look at them and I try to get tips how it should be done properly. <laughs> so when I go to animation schools, I keep on quietly saying to someone, won't you just show me how you're meant to make someone look as if they're walking in classic <laughs> animation style? But you wouldn't want that at all because your whole process, as you've been saying, is to put people together, to create the weight, to create the problem as you're trying to solve the yeah. problem. And very often, when you, um, when you draw an object or, or an animal, I've noticed that it's part of a conversation. You're not saying, now I'm going to sit down here and draw the perfect lily. Yeah. You'll say something like, if you look at a lily and if you, if you, if you plot out this area where the lily could go and then you see the shaft of light coming in. So for you, the, there's a kind of interconnected webness uh, of, of the world, even if the objects stand on, 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 on their own. And uh, you know, that, that process is so important. One of the issues that I think also comes out of this conversation is is a question which I hope we will confront more uh, fully once we've yeah. finished our dialogue. What are the kind of conversations about things that are not art, that are useful to the artist? You know, I, I love this yeah. space, I love this possibility of having theater and dance and conversation in the same space. And I'm wondering now where there is such an emphasis uh, as I see it, on more functional forms of knowledge. Uh, I, I, that, I, I'm wondering what the kind of pressure of these open conversations can be, which I think are extraordinarily important, because I don't think the humanities today are restricted to the disciplines of the humanities. I, they're very important to have that as a kind of training to learn how to draw the rhinoceros in literature is an important disciplinary object. But I think what is also much more important is how we construct not models but a community of values through events and occasions like this. And you have created this space. You have worked in the space yes. of theater. What are your aspirations for this kind of conversation in this space? I think to say what are the aspirations is a bit like saying what do you hope the drawing will mean. I hope that it will mean something at the end, but I can't start with. Let's I can't start, start with. Anyone. Okay, so I can't start with what it will add up to. I would say that in terms of the Centre for the Less Good Idea, um, of which this is one iteration out of of many, um, there's something that's been clear to me over the years from a number of the collaborative projects. And they're collaborative, they're not simply having me working with skilled assistants. It's not experts in different fields. Um, they are experts in, the, in masters of different disciplines that we work with, musicians, editors. Um, but it's rather saying if you bring those different people together with their very extensive knowledge of what they're working on, it's not just that they will then do beautiful editing, but that in thinking about the editing, there will be all sorts of new ideas that come 
into work that is not about editing, that is about making the image, that is about the set design, that is about the nature of um, performance. And working with the dancer is not just to arrive at a beautiful choreography, but to actually also see all sorts of other kinds of movement that aren't dance, but that, or aren't dance in a traditional sense of a rhythmic, graceful set of movements, but which inform how we see the, the project um, developing. And there are conversations with people who aren't necessarily artists, they're not going to write a poem, they're not going to make a piece of music, but which spark ideas in all the participants of ways of seeing the world, ways of understanding. And of course, the, the luxury of, of the arts and of being an uh, artist is that what you are playing with the whole time is the different ways in which we construct or construct either a meaning in the world or a potential meaning or show the way in which one can have meaning as something that is constructed rather than simply received. Um, and I suppose the, having all these different strands into it makes that, makes that clearer. Um, it's difficult to know how a writer would work with, how a choreographer would help a writer with the writing, but I suspect it could. It's much easier to say a choreographer will help an artist with the drawing. Right, no, no, it, and it has, because uh, just to give you one example, again, in a pedagogical context, Toni Morrison, before she retired from Princeton, used to have the atelier, and uh, what she called the atelier, and she would have a writer, and specifically did have a writer and a choreographer working together with the students, and then seeing what their writing uh, you know what they what 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 the, how they the turn that their writing took, but you know I'm very interested in in beginning to understand how important these sorts of conversations are uh, in creating some sense of cultural citizenship. You know that we are citizens in economic terms, political terms, social terms, and yet our culture. Uh, does not emphasize enough, our educations don't emphasize enough, that these great cultural institutions could create values around questions of citizenship or around notions of hospitality. I know that mm -hmm. you've spoken out very strongly against the treatment of refugees in, during that, the refugee struggle and very valiantly. So I'm always struggling with this idea. Is there something like cultural citizenship which is not, you know, which is not prescriptive and normative and regulative. But our schools and our colleges and our universities don't do enough to encourage that sense of value but also that sense of responsibility towards culture. Of course, when we hear that ISIS destroys Palmyra, then you get a gut feeling. But that gut feeling isn't enough because Many things are being destroyed within our own culture. Many living things about communities, traditions, on a daily basis, and we don't see them because they're not part of breaking news. So that's something I wanted you to help me think about. How do we introduce these larger ideas about cultural value at a time when the humanities are being beaten back, when art schools are not receiving the kind of grants, when libraries are being retrenched, uh, when archives are being ignored. I mean, I don't have the, a solution for the, the large I'm scale. I'm not asking for solution. No, no, but how does one even deal with it? Well, I mean, the... Just I know it's. I know it's like a... I know it's like a, a bad quiz where if the answer to every question is in the studio, in the studio, in the studio. But on a very small scale, I think, and that's why the Center for the Less Good Idea was in one sense established as a response to the fact of public initiatives in the arts being in such a perilous mm. and emaciated condition in, in this city. Um, to say if one can't solve a huge institutional question, one needs to make a number of much smaller, more manageable, small ones where the interventions can be a kind of emblem of what is possible. So I'm completely aware of those larger questions, mm -hmm. and good citizenship would say one should try to solve them, but I don't have huge solutions to how they should. But the studio be. practice, I think it's, an, it's a kind of utopian emblem of how things could be, or how things can be. 
Um, you know that when the, the work in the studio finishes for the day, people go back to very different lives. Um, but in that moment of making the march, making the dance, making the object, there's a, a kind of, I suppose, a camaraderie, a sense of working together on a, on a project. And I think also a sense of convergence, that you can come from very different places with very different um, um, trajectories, and you can, be, you can focus on something because you see a certain value for it, and then you can go in, 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 in other directions. Uh, I wanted to finally um, return, in a way, to the procession. Okay. And in particular, to the embodied nature of the procession, which has got a great deal to do with the burden. I think, you know, whatever you say about each specific condition of dispossession, to use the term you, the more mm -hmm. collective term, or anonymity, there is this notion of carrying the burden. And this concept of moving with the burden. Uh, now, it's very suggestive of a whole set of issues to do with nation state formation, the failures of that, of, 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 of that, that kind of uh, political form of statelessness or migration. I don't want to be too allegorical, but I'm saying carrying the burden and moving with the burden is very important. In fact, Hannah Arendt's great origins of totalitarianism, which is now one of the most, you know, read books in this, you know, appalling era of trumpetry, uh, um, uh, was originally in the English edition called The Burden of Our Times. And, you know, thinking of the burden and thinking of your emphasis on movement, which we've talked so much about, there is an image in Arendt which is not uh, often used, where she talks about the condition of statelessness, which, she's, which for her is a very large category, it's not a narrow legal category, as working through the barbed wire labyrinth, as a life lived through the barbed wire labyrinth. And at a time when uh, the, the highly attenuated life is often described by references to Agamben as the bare life, and your silhouette figures could easily resonate with that concept, I think that notions of Agamben are very, very spatial without agency. In your case, for everything you've said today, both about the procession, about the embodiment, about the burden of the body as, an, as a tool, as an object, and as a living life, it seems to me that the notion of the burdened life and the concept of the barbed wire labyrinth is much more resonant to the problems of our own times. And this is why I'm trying to work around this question of the burdened life, some of which I owe to your, to looking at your own work. But the, I mean, the, the burdened life is an, and um, the burden, things that you carry. Um, and the barbed wire are both interesting. We, we're starting work in the studio on a project called The Head and the Load, which is uh, part of a, a proverb, I think a Ghanaian proverb, the head and the load are still the troubles of the neck. Um, about what it is to be carrying things. But we're looking specifically at the First World War in Africa. And there, the vast majority of the million or so casualties, African casualties during the First World War, were not soldiers at the front line, but porters who were there physically carrying all the material of war through the continent to, the, uh, to where the actual fighting Field was theater. happening. And that for each soldier you'd have seven or 14 bearers carrying, carrying the world on their shoulders. So in that sense, it does feel it has immediate resonances. Uh, as does, of course, thinking about the First World War, the idea of the barbed wire labyrinth. So it's a very, for me, it's, it's a, although I only heard it today, that term, the barbed wire labyrinth, before when we were talking earlier, it kind of fits in with so many other other thoughts, which, are, which I'm sure that one could trace back to Arendt from when she's writing in the 
50s. Oh, yes, 50s for that. 50s, but backwards 40, also. 50, but yes. Even though that's term she's using then, that would go um, backwards. And of course, a burden is a thing to, to draw because it's a mixture of uh, a drawing of a human being and a drawing of a still life. Hmm. So you've got the person and you've got whatever it is they're carrying. And in this case, it means they're carrying something physical, even if that physical is actually uh, standing in for psychic burdens or other burdens that aren't necessarily um, I visible. love the way you've immediately drawn the object as much as drawing meaning out of the object. And there is, of course, another reason why the burden is so important, because you know, in the old English sense of the burden as being a music, as being the choral part of a music. The burden of the song was the, was the return to the choral part. But I think now it's time to hear the music from the audience, and I want Good. to thank okay. you very much, William. Good. Thanks a lot. I thank love you. to. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. We can have... I mean, I'm interested in also, in the moment, to hear more from you about the echoes that this has when you're thinking about the burdened life or you're thinking about these other questions. Yeah, no, absolutely. And also your new project. I hope, you know, when we converse about that. Yeah. I mean, I see the burdened life also very much, for instance, in the work of Fanon, um, Franz Fanon, just the sense uh, in a racist encounter uh, in Fanon that you, ha as he says, I have to carry every time I'm racially identified, abused, vilified, or even recognized in a patronizing, oh, Monsieur Fanon, you know, your French is so good, you know, you're, you're like us, you're not like them, come on, man. Uh, even at that point, you are made to be accountable immediately for your whole ethnic history, for the whole history of empire, for the whole history of liberation, for resistance, these are real psychic burdens. That's why he says, I, in that particular moment, I was, a split, I was split into three parts. I was never allowed to articulate them as a third person. You know, the moi and the je, you know, the, uh, the sense of I as an object, I as a subject, which is the, in a sense, the dialogue of a democratic thing, that you can be both the object and the subject and actually work between them. But here with this kind of objectification, you are burdened by fitting into somebody else's fetish structure or somebody else's power structure. And then you're like a little cutout with everything else burdening you. So I, I, I you know, I'm, as I say, very stimulated by your work in this area and hope to, and hope to continue with that notion of the burden, both with its physicality, but also its other symbolic and psychic and political implications. Should we have some questions? Yes. So on the question of anonymity, and then the very local dimension to the work, very specific, we as a local audience recognize some of those performers some of the people in the procession, you, when you're working with them, they're not enacting a role. They're not taking on a character. They're representing themselves. So, so the idea of an anonymity, I, I wasn't comfortable with the conversation because it didn't seem to me, for an audience who doesn't know them, maybe they're anonymous, but for a very local audience, they're very specific and very particular. I'm happy to go for this one, yeah. although I'm not yeah. local. Yes. Precisely because I'm not local, I'm happy. I think I, I, I see the point. Uh, at least the way I've always understood that word anonymity was, is not about erasing them or not about creating a general category, but saying that there is a trying to find the, that there is something in these different conditions of dispossession, if I could use William's term, 
which actually does create a solidarity. And it is something that could be quite intangible. It could be either exploitation of a certain kind, it could be the, the use of the physical body as opposed to other forms of exploitation or other forms of oppression. So I think anonymity is not uh, a, a, a nowhereness or a nobodiness. It is a way of trying to see something intangible that repeats in each of these processional figures and processional moments. You know, here again, I'm sorry, today I sound as if I'm doing a PR job for Hannah Arendt. Uh, but but I, I, I do want to say this, because one of the things she says is that is least tangible in the network of human life is what she calls human interest, that which lies between, interest, that which lies between people. And she said it is the most fragile and the most vulnerable thing. And often it is simply language and, and the relationship between language and action. So that's, I think, anonymity is not to name a condition, but to ask a question about shareable conditions outside of specificities. This is the way I see it. I don't want to speak for you. No, 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 that's... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. This question's there. Okay. And here. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, so it's, it's, it's a question and a, and, a, and, a, and a comment, and it's about um, walking um, and, and perhaps the paradox of walking, particularly in the city, um, and, and to observe that, um, that walking goes beyond the intimacy of, of the study of walking into a very complex place of politic, race, and class. And, and, I, and, and just an observation perhaps of or what is the observation of a city which I imagine, why well, I see Johannesburg to be as a city that is in I can't hear you, sir. As a city that is... Um, in, it's almost in, in a paradox of a tension between the commuter and the walker, and 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 the, and there is you know there is a, there is a complexity to that because the walker is is separated because of class, because of race, because of privilege, and 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 how do we perhaps how do we transcend beyond the grammar of the studio? And the grammar of the, you know, studying the walking in a studio to transcend it beyond that into a place which separates us in the city. Because how many people came here by a car and how many people walked here? Well, no, I mean, the, what you observe about the city is right. There's a lot to be said about walking and thinking and different kinds of walking from the ambulatory in cloisters to the aristocratic promenades to the bourgeois passeggiatas that people would have. And there one thinks of how those have transformed of the promenade des Anglais and the Ramblas, which were the emblematic civic spaces of people free to walk and think and the strange status they have now to the most bastardized form of walking and thinking, which would be doing it in the gym, where you walk on the spot, and not only that, you can't even think for yourself because you're listening to a, your headphones are thinking for you. Your podcast is thinking for you. So it's kind of the ways within that, but of course within the city and in Johannesburg, everywhere here, as you say, the, in public spaces, the difference in walking between classes and race is enormous. But I think, if I might just add to that, I think the practice, at least what I learn from reflecting on what William says, that the practice of the studio is not necessarily a transcendence. It's not necessarily an attempt to transcend the very appropriate and pertinent things you mention. It is somehow to produce a, 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 um, to, 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 produce an, to, take, to produce elements of those experiences within an artifice, within an artifice. And what the artifice allows us to do is for those of us who are, like me, a person of color walking in a certain place, then when I see it in a procession, for argument's sake, 
I not only identify with myself, but I'm able to identify with other figures of walking. So the, so the studio practice is a kind of moral montage, or an ethical montage, if you like. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the ability to deal with alterity, to deal with who you are not, when, where, who you are not at that time, and indeed when you are on the street, you are trapped in precisely the things you mentioned. But going along with your thinking, I think, and adding to Williams, I think that there are ways of walking uh, that are very political. The demonstration. What did we do in the United States after this, you know, this uh, vacuous and horrific um, fate befell us? Immediately after that, people gathered to walk together. And we walked in some terrible weather. You know, it's, uh, this is not the African winter in Mass Boston, Massachusetts. It's, you know, it's serious stuff. Uh, and I love, I would come and have your African winter any day of the week and any day of the year. I can assure you that. But I'm just saying people felt that they had to occupy that public square. And one of the acts of solidarity and convergence, because there were people from very different perspectives saying we cannot live with this result. But they walked, they came. And I think occupying the, the, the city through walking is extraordinarily important. And forms of suburban transport, I, which are absolutely essential, don't give us that same kind of face-to-faceness that we could, and in, under the best circumstances, have while walking. Which is, this is, I think, so we, we, why um, you know Walter Benjamin uh, talks about the flaneur in the 19th century, or de Certeau in his great essay, Walking in the City, talks about the different ways in which you can scale yourself in relation to others, but not only on a personal level, but in relation to other kinds of problems in the urban environment. Does that in some way respond to you, sir? Okay, thank you. If, um, if maybe you could expand on that slightly, um, given the questions around cultural citizenship and responsibility. Can't, can't hear you, sir. Uh, if you could expand on that slightly in relation to cultural citizenship and responsibility, where it comes to the institution, is it not the walls of the studio, the walls of the museums, the walls of the uh, institutions that, to a certain extent, don't allow the walking, in a different sense of the word, to actually penetrate, where it's just the artist or the cultural producer that's really extracting that walk, but not really the audience that gets to interact or move in and out of that space. So you know, maybe the role of the artist and the audience has shifted slightly in today's thinking. It's not to walk away from or, or, or can discredit what's happening in the studio, but rather to say maybe the public space should become the studio, or could become a new studio. I can't hear the question. It's about saying, should the public space become the studio, so the walking isn't confined in the studio, but goes through the walls, becomes a different. I think, I mean, markets are from my side. There, I mean, there are artists like yourself, in which the public space is the studio and the, and the canvas as well. Um, I'm not saying that the, the space I carve out in the studio is necessarily the only kind of studio to have, but I'm talking about what happens within this kind of space that we're in now that is possible and how that works. Um, I wouldn't be able to work in a public space as a studio myself. I wouldn't know where to walk. I'd be embarrassed about every step. It's too public a space for the stupidity I need in the studio. But seeing what you're doing with the Center for the Less Good Idea, you're giving those that are in the studio the chance, uh, in the street, the chance to move into the studio. So it's a quite an exciting dialogue that you are having within the studio context. And I think the institutions, generally speaking, should be having more of those facilitated dialogues. I think so too. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's clearly so. But actually. Uh, at least with my, my uh, 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 modest encounter with uh, museums and working with museums in, it's a, in the United States, this is what you mentioned, what you identify is probably the, the most significant issue that both curators and directors think about. Of course, there are certain physical constraints uh, 
to, it, 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 to in, in, the, in the museum. I'm now not talking yeah. about the studio, I'm now yeah. talking about the museums, but it seems to me that people are very concerned about how you construct new narratives or new sets of narratives within the museum space or within the gallery space, which allows both for uh, concerted walking, but also for aberrant walking within that space. Uh, so I think that this is very much on people's minds. I, I've agreed now to work with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, to help the director think in precisely those terms as to how one can actually permeate <laughs> the museum with uh, internal narratives of difference uh, and also, on the other hand, bring other kinds of narratives within it. So I think that this is something uh, very uh, significant and I'm heartened, at least from my narrow experience, that it's, it's, it's an issue that is being taken very seriously. I mean, for a completely practical reason, I think we have to bring this to an end. There's a theater performance of, of Rosa Albert happening in, uh, the other, in the center itself in half an hour, but the point is that the chairs we have here are needed for the audience <laughs> there. So without wanting to stop this, the it chairs are going walking. The chairs are going walking. Yes. So I would just thank you. Thank you. What thank a pleasure you. it's thank been. You. Thank you very much.